Thank you, dear, and good morning, everyone. How are you all? Um, I'm Auntie Agnes Shea, and I'm one of the Ngunnawal Elders, and I'm very proud to be invited here today to welcome you to uh, the country of the Ngunnawal people. But firstly, I'd like to acknowledge our guest speakers and also all of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island friends and our non-Indigenous friends who have joined us here today. I'll say a bit firstly about the Ngunnawal country and the people. I'll explain the meaning of a welcome and then I'll say a bit about this special event that's happening. I'll just change my glasses. Where are the other ones? Um, I'm blind in one eye, so I, excuse me if I do make a bit of mistakes, but anyhow, the Ngunnawal community are the traditional custodians of Canberra and the region. The audience may not be aware that the Ngunnawal nation is made up of several family groups and not just individuals who represent the interest of this country. Therefore, as a community, we have an elected body known as the United Ngunnawal Elders Council to represent us, along with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island elected body of the ACT. This is important for you to understand and acknowledge, for our, our identity is a collective identity. There are other Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples from many nations around the country and the world who have come to live on the Ngunnawal land, and I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to them also, especially those who have joined us here today. Now I'll explain the meaning of a welcome. The tradition of welcoming people is a cultural practice that was handed down by our old people from the beginning of time. Before entering another person's country, you would always announce your arrival and not enter until a traditional owner of that country welcomed you. And the reason for this practice is to protect your spirit while you're in another person's country, but also show respect for the people of the country you're entering. And as one of the Ngunnawal elders, I'm now very, very proud to see when non-Indigenous organisations and government do ask an elder to come and do welcome to country, it shows that they are also respecting our traditional culture and it helps to build the reconciliation and bring respect between many cultures of people who now live in the ACT and region, but also throughout Australia. The Ngunnawal people, as with all Aboriginal people, have a great heritage that we would like to share with all Australians from every walks of life. And as you are aware, Canberra in the Ngunnawal language means meeting place. And Canberra has been a place of gathering for many Aboriginal tribes of Australia to come together to deal with important businesses, but all for ceremonial occasions. Our ancestors also believed in the importance of people gathering together for the purpose of building relationships, sharing knowledge, and to celebrate the gift of heritage and history. We believe it is important for all to recognise our unique histories and to gain understanding that our land is our heritage and how the loss of land has disconnected many Aboriginal people from their spiritual links, cultural heritage and identity. And now I'll just say a, a little bit about this uh, special event that's happening today and tomorrow. As the 40th anniversary of the establishment of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy is upon us this week, I join you as we all pay tribute to the Embassy and to its founders. The Tent Embassy is not just an historical symbol to us, but an ongoing reminder that we are still 
defining our people's political status and rights in this country. The issues of disadvantage, self-determination and sovereignty have always been at the heart of the Embassy's platform and have been the basic of the continuous fight for equality. I am honoured to be here to welcome you all to this two-day forum hosted by the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. And I wish you well in exploring matters that are of great importance to our future. So once again, thank you very much for inviting me. I uh, can't stay because uh, I've got a couple other commitments. But uh, I do wish you all the best. And those who've uh, joined us today for the first time, I, I do still a very special welcome to you. And now I'll just finish in the words of the Ngunnawal people. Nagana Yarrabai Yangu, which means you're welcome to leave your footprints on our land now. Or in other words, again, welcome to Ngunnawal country. Thank you. Thank you, Ani Agnes, for that uh, very fine welcome to country. And um, let me start by also paying my respects to the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of this region, and um, how important it is for us to have recognition of this uh, cultural welcome. It is very much a recognition that we are the true owners of the land and that we have continuing rights. These are rights that existed for thousands and thousands of years before colonisation and continue today. And it is always heartening to hear people providing us with such welcomes. And not only to remind us, but to remind all other people, Australians and visitors, of the very, very strong link between the people and the land. I'd like to um, provide a brief introduction. Um, the program this morning is fairly tight, so I just wanted to give a little bit of a background to this forum and the Congress and what it's about. But let me start talking about the Aboriginal Ten Embassy. As we know, in a few days' time, it'll be the 40th anniversary of the establishment of the Aboriginal Ten Embassy on the lawns in front of what was then the Parliament House. At the time, it drew a lot of attention. It was a time of confrontation where the government's first reaction was to try and use force, to use police and so on to stop Aboriginal people from protesting for rights. The Aboriginal Ten Embassy has continued for 40 years and is now part of Australian history. It was established in 1972, but only existed intermittently for the first 20 years. But since 1992, the Ten Embassy has been a permanent presence at that location. The 40th anniversary is already proving to be a significant time for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people around Australia in a revival of concerns about the things that the Ten Embassy was protesting for in 1972. When the Embassy was originally established, it was a response to the government of the day that refused to accept that Aboriginal people might have land rights. And so the original protest that came from the members at the Ten Embassy was for land rights. However, in the Embassy's petition, which was drawn up a month later, it showed that self-determination and sovereignty was central to the campaign for rights. Let me just quickly talk about the Congress and this forum. It's a bit disturbing to see, particularly in the last month, a lot of misinformation being circulated about the Congress. We hear it being referred to as the National, as the NIC, um, which was the body that the Howard government had appointed to advise the government. 
the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples was deliberately established to be independent of government. It's established as a company, and it's a company that is owned by its members, and the members are only Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations. Whatever happens to the Congress about its structure, about its future, about the things it stands for, are in the hands of the members, either through the elected board or through the elected delegates to the National Congress meetings or through the members in changing the constitution. It is not a government body. The members and the representatives are not government puppets. In fact, if we look at the succession of national representative bodies, and I will talk on that later today, we will see that there's been a strong development for political, uh, a strong movement for political development of Aboriginal and Torres Strait people, and for the most part, Congress has got it right. When Congress was mooted, it was argued that it should be developed consistent with Article 18 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The Declaration itself is a benchmark in the struggle for rights, being adopted nearly five years ago by the United Nations General Assembly on the 13th of September 2007. And the Declaration sets out what are now universal standards for the human rights of Indigenous peoples. While some governments and countries might not respect those standards or acknowledge those standards, the fact is they are the universal human rights standards. And as such, all members of the United Nations are expected to promote and protect those rights. Although when the adoption of the Declaration occurred, four governments voted against the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We know that was Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the USA. All of those governments, each of those governments, starting with Australia, have now expressed their support for the Declaration and their preparedness to see the Declaration implemented. And since those governments have changed their position, the Declaration has now become adopted by consensus. That is, no government in the world of the 193 members of the United Nations, none of those governments oppose these rights. And that's an important part of the development of the human rights norms of the world and, as we will see, the development of international human rights on which the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia can place a lot of hope. The election of the National Aboriginal Congress, sorry, the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, the board, uh, commenced early last year and the elected board came into being on the 8th of July. So it's just on the six month mark that the elected board has now taken over. I'd like to again repeat, it's an elected board elected by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and government has no say in either those elections or the structure of the Congress. I mentioned that the Congress was established consistent with Article 18 of the Declaration. Let me tell you what Article 18 says. It says, Indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision making in matters which would affect their rights through representatives chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedure, as well as to maintain and develop their own Indigenous decision-making institutions. 